I'm happy to be here. This is my first opportunity to speak before economists. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, these past couple of days have been absolutely enlightening. I'm happy to be here. So I'm going to be talking, I'm going to give a historical perspective about the Black Wall Street in Durham, North Carolina. And so there's a couple of things I think you should know before I get started. It's one of the Black Wall Streets that most people don't talk about because it didn't get burned down like Tulsa. It's arguably the wealthiest Black Wall Street that ever existed in the United States of America. It existed in the shadows of the 1898 Wilmington race riot, which we now know was a political coup for the Republicans to take over the state of North Carolina. That's the same year that North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company was founded in Durham, North Carolina. It was a cradle-to-grave society, meaning you could be born in a black hospital. You can go to school at all black elementary, middle school, high school, graduate, go to college at an HBCU, North Carolina Central University, and then be buried in an all-black cemetery. They had anchor institutions that provided wealth. North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, Mechanics and Farmers Bank. Durham's Black Wall Street survived the pandemic of the 1900s, the Great Depression, World War II, the Korean War. And as it was ending, African countries were gaining independence. The Civil Rights Movement had made great pro progress with the 1964 and 1965 Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act, and the Vietnam War was in full swing. The historic marker located downtown Durham in the early decades of the 1900s, Durham acquired a national reputation for businesses owned by African Americans that lined Parish Street. Among them were North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, and Mechanics and Farmers Bank. This historic marker is a symbol of the economic prowess and entrepreneurial spirit that existed in Durham, North Carolina at the turn of the 20th century. Um, one of the things that I'm also gonna do with this presentation is I've been collecting or interviews from community residents. Some were residents and living in Durham during the height of the Black Wall Street era. This first person that you're going to see is going, uh, the first interview you're going to see is Dr. Lavonia Allison. But this first, this is a map of the Haytai district. So you can kind of see where it was physically located in the city of Durham. And Durham is also unique because as a city, Durham is the only city in Durham County. Most counties have multiple municipalities within. So Durham is unique in that regard. And Dr. Allison was born in the 1930s, and she lived there. Her father was an entrepreneur. He owned a real estate company. She taught at North Carolina Central University and the University of uh, North Carolina at Chapel Hill. But one of the things that she's known in the community is she served as the chairman for 14 years of the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People. She's very outspoken. And so when I was doing the interview, I asked her, Dr. Allison, what did black people do with the money they had during Haiti? How, how did they create wealth? I mean, how did they sustain themselves? It got to own some honey. And when you own it, you don't have to ask them for anything. Did I tell you I can start walking from Lincoln Hospital all the way down the street, cross to Pettigrew, to that other pass? And we didn't have to ask them for a thing. And they were a whole lot of poor, but it's even popular. He made some property up and down, too, in Valuable Park. Absolutely. <clears throat> even over there by Duke. <laughs> I mean, black folk own land. Sitting beside her was her husband, Pete Allison. At the time of this interview, um, Pete Allison was 93 years old. So many of the people that I interviewed, I think the oldest one was 100 years old. And at the time of the interview, and he was the former mayor of Durham, and he was the mayor when the civil rights protests started in the, in the early 1960s. And I, I don't have his clip here because all of his clips were just too long to, to talk about because he was a part of the city council, 
prior to um, them voting, prior to them voting uh, to bring in urban renewal. Durham was not the usual southern city entrenched in history of racial and class-based separation. It was sparsely populated by farmers until the railroad was routed through in 1893. Tobacco warehouses sprung up along the tracks. The Haytai community was the epicenter of the majority of businesses and homes for African Americans. Black people developed the, cra grave, the cradle to grave community where they could be born in the hospital and we went through all of that. But this is what Pettigrew Street looked like during its heyday. So on Sunday, and, and some people may remember this in their respective communities, you take your girl out on walk up like that, go get some ice cream or a little something to eat. But that's when you got dressed up and you show it off, your good clothes and, 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 and your lady friend. And so, but just looking at this picture, you can see how proud the community was. Booker T. Washington, W.B. Du Bois, E. Franklin Frazier all frequently visited Durham, North Carolina, as did, as did any number of entertainers and musicians. And they all spoke highly of Durham as a center or epicenter of entrepreneurship, as a place that other black communities should look at to see how it should be done. The next slide is going to be of Miss Virginia Williams. Miss Virginia Williams came to Durham, North Carolina, when she was 19 years old, in like 1956, from Northampton County, very rural place. So, so Durham was the big city for her. She wanted to leave in, in hopes that she could find a, a job and have a better life for herself. And so. She got involved with the Royal Ice Cream Parlor activities in 1957, that sit-in, and they were arrested. Seven people were, were arrested. So when North Carolina a and I, I know there's a representative in here from North Carolina a and So in 1961, they had the students sit in, but in Durham, it was in 1957. Um, but that's another one of those things that history often overlooks. But this is Miss Virginia Williams. I asked her, so tell me, what was Haiti like when you showed up in Durham, North Carolina at the age of 19? Jumping. It was jumping. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what that store is. I think it's some African store right there by W.D. Pearson, W.D. Hill Recreation Center. That was the college in then, and that was where everybody met. Then no matter where else you went, you met at the college in. It was run by Mr. Bill Jones and his wife, a very nice place to go. Then there was the Goodwill Club, which was a little further up the street. We had the Square Club was uh, on the second floor of a supermarket, which was, hey, Tower was, you had a piccolo joint in there, you had a club downstairs, the black businesses, you had uh, the dry cleaners, Mr. Boykins dry cleaners. It was, if you weren't here and if you don't see it, I can't make you know how it was. But it was uh, about at least 10 different beauty shops on Fayetteville Street. It was uh, about five barber shops there. Uh, I believe there was, there was a branch bank, a mechanic and farmers bank, insurance companies, black businesses, boom. Oh, there was the drugstore, Garrett Parker Drugstore. I wish you could see it. I wish I could paint a picture of it, but I loved it. This is a photograph of North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance through the years. So you can see how expansive the buildings got. This building used to be the tallest building in Durham for years, like 60 years. It was the tallest building in Durham. Mechanics of Farmers Bank and their founders. Pictured here are more black-owned businesses. 
Briegel Theater. You see how many barbers are in that one barber shop? This is the Biltmore Hotel. So imagine, you know, in 1933, I'm a member of uh, Omega Psi Phi fraternity. They had a grand conclave there because they had a black hotel. One of the few black hotels that existed that black folk was safe, felt safe to come in the South. Pictured here, the entrance to North Carolina Central University, Old School Lincoln Hospital, Hillside High School, Gear Cemetery, the Carolina Times, a black-owned newspaper that existed in Durham, North Carolina. The Haytai community flourished in the segregated South because African Americans practiced group economics and group politics. The first major investment was economic with the development of North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company in 1898. The money derived from this company helped to finance Mechanics of Farmers Bank and North Carolina Mutual Savings and Loan Company in 1907 and 1921, respectively. The banks gave loans to develop smaller businesses. People were also able to obtain home and car loans. This created a solid middle class in Durham. The money spent in Haytai Community Business District virtually never left the community, and the businesses supported the African American community in Durham. The second thing was they practiced group politics. Practicing group politics led to the founding of the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People in 1935. There are no dues. All you have to do is be a resident of the Durham community. It gave African Americans a voice in the political affairs of Durham. The committee vigorously pursued nine major categories of activity, economics, politics, education, health, housing, youth, religious freedom, human affairs, and civic affairs. Politics is controlled by money, and the business district in the Haytai community, coupled with the wealthy black middle class in Durham, provided a platform for leverage for politics. Essentially, what I'm saying is, because North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance was so profitable, white people were able to invest their money in the company. It kept the peace, because they were making a lot of money. And so they weren't about to let people come in and mess up their money through these companies and the banks. Urban renewal devastated the Haytai community as redeveloped and rehab or rehabilitation property in the city took precedence uh, as the result of competitive or cooperative effort for private developers and local government. The decision was made to build Highway 147 um, through the Haytai business and residential community to make way for the development of the Research Triangle Park as the tobacco and cigarette manufacturing industries ending, the city was looking for a way to provide jobs and remain relevant as part of a growing technological industry. This is a picture. So to your left is old Haytai. To your right is what it looks like now. Over 600 homes were lost. Over 100 businesses were lost never to come back. These are just a few of the businesses that survived the Black Wall Street urban renewal. And I'm not sure, I wrote a robot space auto the other day and it was closed. And Mr. Spate, who's the founder, his daughter and son, I think they're in their late 80s now. And they had just um, sold the, the, uh, the business but then they ran another, they expanded the highway. So for a number of months, people weren't able to get in to get their cars fixed. This next slide is Alice Sharp and Joanne Abel. They are both librarians. Alice Sharp is the African-American woman. She was born in Durham. She didn't live in the Haytai area, but she lived several blocks up. And so she, I asked them, what did they think was lost with Haytai, with ur through urban renewal, as, as Haytai was devastatingly destroyed. It was just total destruction of 
of a way of of it was just total destruction of of a way of of life and in a lot of ways um it took a lot of role models because like i said you know every we we were self-contained we had everything we needed in our community um there in haiti in terms of, of black owned businesses and i think that it, it just dealt a, a real economic blow and a, and a blow to the psyche, you know, all of a sudden, all of those role models, you know, the, for little black kids, you couldn't aspire to who owning my own business on, 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 in Haiti on Pettigrew Street. That was all gone. And um, I think it really tore the black community fabric here in Durham. I, I had a friend whose son graduated in sociology, got his master's, and I asked her, was he gonna start his own business? And she said, no. She said, he doesn't have that kind of background that you have of seeing black people own their businesses. He doesn't have that. He doesn't have that reference point. And so I think for a lot of black children growing up in Durham, we lost that reference point of, yes, you can succeed, you can have your own business, you you can make a, a great living and 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 that that was gone. It just I don't know if whatever we got in return for that, it wasn't worth it. So you can see it was more than just money that was lost. It was this whole notion of I, identity. So if you were poor, you were the janitor at the school, but you lived across the street from the president of North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company and your children grew up, your child could start working in a place and start learning skills early. So they could definitely see the change and be a part of the change. So this is Joanne Abel. She moved to Durham. And so, you know, she, her perspective is, you can hear about a place, you hear about things. So I always talk to my students, you can know something, but not have knowledge of it. You can know something, have knowledge of it, but not have understanding. So her moving to Durham and being around the residents of Durham gave her not the understanding that she didn't have. So many people lost wealth. Mm -hmm. They lost their homes, which is what most middle class people, and those sort of changed recently. That was their wealth. And they lost, so not even the, I've known about the businesses mm -hmm. being lost, but when I thought of, I think over 500 homes were lost. And I think that that's the debt that Durham owes, is that, that we eradicated wealth mm -hmm. in the African American community as well. History is made of the lifeblood of the people. That's my presentation, it's my time. Thank you. I'd like to say good morning to everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Andre Van. Um, I'm the uh, coordinator of Universal Archives and instructor of public history at North Carolina Central University. Um, but as we say in the South, I, I must introduce myself by the name of my family. Um, my parents, um, Martha and Cecil Hawkins Van, were um, grocery store owners. Owned a f grocery store and fish market for 40 years in a community that was created by my great-great-grandmother, who was a midwife delivered all the babies, white and black, from during the institution of slavery, post-emancipation, up until her death in 1901. That is a world I inherited. Three brothers, by the way, with degrees in business. Although I remind them, I know more about the business than they do, I'm just saying. <laughs> and, and we will tell you about our grocery store in, the, in our little community, which is very much synonymous with Durham, North Carolina. It, it is the idea that as we always would say, um, we were known as one location, one near you, as George Jefferson once said. And so one, one could always count on our business, just as the businesses in Durham, as an opportunity, but more importantly, as an anchor in the African American community. 
The, the question raised um, in this um, methodology and report ask us to sort of look at how do we go back and reframe the history of a community that once was, but also linking that with the presentness where we are. And so I want to provide with you a, a wonderful um, excerpt from a 1928 article um, from a, a weekly newspaper, the St. Luke Herald, which was a black weekly newspaper in Richmond, Virginia. And, and this was a paper in Richmond because Richmond is one of these centers, um, economic centers. It said, go to Durham, you need the inspiration. Go to Durham and see Negro business with an aggregate capital of millions. Go to Durham and see 22 Negro men making modern history. But among your New Year's resolves, resolve to go to Durham. And, and that is the backdrop. That is a part of the, the question and of the historical memory that we are seeking. And I think through this report, we were able to answer. And so also, I, I want to thank my colleagues here um, and members of the team for helping to sort of resurrect these stories and, and bring them to life uh, through this wonderful report that has been created. Uh, I told folk, I am lucky. I get to wake up each and every morning, much like a, a griot in Africa, with only one sole job and goal, to preserve the history and heritage of our people and our community. But also, I remind folk that our people have neither been lost nor forgotten. And so we spend each and every day working to maintain and make sure that these records are preserved. We do that by recording these records, researching with these records, and most importantly, writing about the people and the lives of those who are in this community. And so we wake up each and every day, beginning anew, to preserve this history and heritage, and that's important. We work to ensure that the records that we've preserved today are for those for tomorrow, and that is equally important. And so, as we say it, um, I, I will note um, through a quick presentation for you um, just a little glimpse. Um, and, and when I came to Durham as a freshman, 1988, um, yeah, I know I don't look it. I know I'm young. I know. Um, <laughs> my, my inaction before I arrived was this. Um, our, our family, just like every other family, African-American family in North Carolina, held a policy from North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company. We grew up with the calendars coming in the mail and sitting there on our walls of seeing these prosperous African-American men reflected there. That's the world I inherited. But when I got to Durham, um, opened up a, a bank account because my mother and father told me to do it, and I was going to do it anyway, I guess, uh, at the Mechanics and Farmers Bank, uh, of which, uh, full disclosure, I own a little stock in it, by the way. Uh, <laughs> when, when I needed to get my clothes cleaned, right, we had little rooms in, in the residence halls. We had weavers cleaners, an African-American cleaner. I, I could go right down Fever Street, get it done. Uh, when I needed a watch repaired or shoes cleaned, we had a, a person who did the shoes, did our watches. When we wanted food outside the campus, had a little bit of change, we'd go down to the green counter where, where Ms. Anzola Allen had her own system and policy as to those who came in her business. And you learn to live by those rules or get out. I, I served as executive director and head of the PAC of the Durham Committee on Affairs of Black People that, that Dr. Harper just mentioned earlier. Uh, and attended church at White Rock Baptist Church, the oldest church there. And, and so you, you learn that uh, you know, when you come into a community, you immerse yourself in the history and culture of the people, uh, not for a moment, um, but for a lifetime. And, and I've done that, and they've been very pleasing to me. So, so let me begin with a few quick points. I always remind folk of uh, what James Joel said. He said these very famous words. Uh, he said that the aim of the historian like that of the artist is to, as he note there, to, to enlarge our pitch of the world and to give us a new way of looking at things. And I think that is important when we think about this question of economic survivability, economic um, adjustment in terms of African Americans. But, but two very important things I want you to keep in mind, what we call movements and memory, right? Uh, movements are important, right? But, but so too are, are memory, because both uh, remind us that these important moments matter. And so when we talk about these historical movements, it's sort of a look at the, these moments and actions in the life of these, some of the, not just the families, but also in, in the terms of the African-American corporations, and whether or not they were able to be replicated generation-wise over and over. Uh, and so, so we've, we've seen some did survive, and others um, fell by the wayside. But, but these two things, and how a community remembers its memory is important, right? And, and, and so every now and then we have to do as, um, this is the only thing I took from Ronald Reagan, the only thing. Um, <laughs> he, he, he was, uh, yeah, yeah, believe it. Yeah, uh, he, he said, trust but verify, right? And, and so we trust that when people share these stories and narratives and with us, but we also have to go out and go after the evidence to verify what happens. And that is what we do each and every day, right? Uh, but also, 
We understand that each and every town has a past and has a history. That's important, right? They, whether it's good or bad, you, you know, you have to admit it, right? Whether good or bad, that's important. That's what we do. Uh, but also, we understand that the historical record is never complete and requires us to uh, look and search just a little bit more, right? So, so we had a little simple plan of action in regards to taking a look at um, the study of Black Wall Street and, and the African American community in Durham. Um, we, we sought to build a framework for understanding um, the African American business community in Durham. Uh, and events, most importantly, that shaped it. Uh, I, I was pleased, I've authored uh, two works, um, Durham's Haytai and African Americans of Durham County, two um, pictorial history books to sort of help have a better connection to the people there. Uh, and, and that offers a wonderful glimpse. But also we had to create a historical timeline to help understand contextually how these business and corporations fit into the social movements and currents that, that occurred in America. But, and also we assess the impact of these businesses, not just uh, against Durham and, and the Triangle area, as you say, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, but we also ventured out in the United States of America. And, and I dare say we probably should have added um, all across America, all across the world, because they had a footprint in each and other of those places as well. We looked at the holdings of archival institutions, uh, not just um, at university settings, at North Carolina Central University, um, Duke University, UNC Chapel Hill, but also the public libraries as well, the state archives. All of these have been uh, important and key to helping us to understand and really resurrect these stories and these histories as well. Um, and also, we had to look at the newspapers. Uh, and, and I know a lot of folk in this room probably don't read the regular newspaper today. I, I still go, go around the corner and buy a newspaper, by the way. Uh, but, but it's important to sort of go back, and luckily North Carolina, through the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center, they've digitized many of these records. You can go online, you can pull them all up, and you can kind of go in and, and trace the, the growth and development, you know, over a hundred year span uh, of, of this the corporate history of African Americans in Durham, right? That's important. That is key. And it is certainly available, all right? And, and so, and then lastly, um, a look at the social media. Uh, and, and looking at each and every little instance where, and then testing what was said with whether or not that reality totally and did in fact exist. Um, and, and so as we move in, um, to, to sort of add a little bit to Jim, and I won't spend too much time on this, but, but it's just sort of, uh, these are sort of four ways. If you never see this again, just say you saw it here first, right? Uh, <laughs> It's about looking at ways. Um, I was an early student that um, took classes under looking at Jim Crow in the South at Duke University, North Carolina Central University. And, and so we came up with about, about four basic ways to sort of understand the African American movement in America. One is the question of mobility, you know, the, the, the fact that people had opportunity to migrate away. And what did they do with that? And where did they go? That's important. Understand that mobility mattered. But also um, what we call moved against, meaning um, institution building among African Americans. And I've highlighted a few examples there for you. Uh, our institution, North Carolina Central University, classic example uh, of institution building among African Americans in the midst of segregation and Jim Crow in the South. Uh, but also I remind you as well that um, there were lots of African American centers and communities, right? A, a few of them in Durham, not just Haytown, we had Hickstown, and even in the bottoms. Uh, and, and don't let the bottoms fool you, because I know as many doctors and lawyers that came out of the bottoms than anywhere else in, in the United States of America. And then lastly, move towards or around oppression, meaning that they sought to live within the confines of segregation. So this is the context in which, you know, when we research and study the lives of others, we have to take all this into account. And I would tell you the same, if you're looking at Jim Crow and looking at segregation or anything in the South, these are some of the variables you want to take a look at. Um, but also, but that change in narrative reminds us that we have to look at new ways to sort of look at Jim and Jane Crow, most importantly, right? And, and around the question of desegregation. But we also understand, again, there are gaps in the narrative. Uh, and, and it re requires us to uh, add a little bit more scholarship to this area. Uh, and then lastly, we, re we reminded that by challenging, challenging the traditional narratives that have been written, helps to create a much more new and much more broader narrative that allows us to include in the stories of those that have been marginalized and left out of these narratives. And, and so that's in, important, including not just um, other African American communities, but uh, women in general, and also the working class communities, uh, which oftentimes gets overlooked. I'm almost there. Uh, uh, so, so but, but let me take a second, just a minute, that's all I got, uh, to talk about the question of historical memory. Uh, and, and that is important, you know, when you have a chance to do so. Because you find that oftentimes individual memory, you know, is, is present, is, is there. But also we have to look to this question of this collective memory and how do all in this group re remember this. 
Um, also, recording memory is important because there's an emotional attachment to these stories and these narratives. And I would have people, you know, as I was writing in 1999, this book on Haiti, people would tell me all these great stories. And I just said, wow, but I still got to go out and check what you said, see if it's accurate. Um, but, but, but that memory still stays alive of a community that was decimated by urban um, renewal, or as they called it, Negro removal. Um, they understood that these stories mattered, and they would transfer them on down to others. But, but also, um, th these meanings and these stories talk about entrepreneurship, and, but also ask us to redefine the question of the world of work, and what does that mean? Because traditionally, in the narratives and stories that we have written about, we talked about the North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, the Kansas and Farmers Bank, we talk, but we didn't spend a lot of time talking about the day-to-day, -day, um, those who engage in activities um, usually not recorded, usually unknown, uh, and, and that requires us to do just a little bit more work around that. And, and so also we understand that a lot of this history, people don't talk about it, is painful history, right? When you're asking people who have lost their homes, urban renewal came about and they never received the full uh, amount to go back and rebuild their home or their business, that matters. We're talking about 500 folk, uh, families displaced from one community, over 120 businesses decimated and had to move to other parts of the city. That mattered. Only, only four things survived. Uh, the, a branch of the Mechanics and Farmers Bank, uh, uh, the sanctuary of the St. Joseph's AME Church, sad to say, um, with service printing company, and then lastly, I do not want to say, uh, the ABC and liquor store. That, that survived. <laughs> four things survived out of the entire neighborhood, right? I, I'm, I'm shutting up, y'all, moving on. Uh, but, but also, we, we take comfort from the present because of the anxiety, all right? And that's important. Um, race and place newspapers, so I, I give you some examples to look, look at. Um, um, Digital NC, um, the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center, one of the greatest resources you will find in the South, where you can just go and in that search bar, put in any topic you're looking for, just about relative to North Carolina and the South, and you'll find it there. But, but also, um, the Carolina Times, a good friend of mine, uh, three generations, um, own family, um, and that newspaper. Unfortunately, my, my good friend died last summer, and so we're, we're trying to find a way to resurrect that paper and bring back a, a similar edition to it. But you do have access to the digital version of that newspaper as well, along with our counterparts in Raleigh, whose story and heritage is similar to ours, the Raleigh Carolinian. And then, of course, our campus newspapers was full of stories and advertisements from all these businesses that exist in the African American community. So I will say race and place newspapers matter. Uh, we, we also go to non-traditional sources. I'm gonna get my look in a minute. We go to non-traditional sources. For instance, how many, how many have, how many keep funeral programs? Yeah, I know it's not a sexy topic, I get it. But, but let me just tell you how important they are. They are important to creating the narrative on the life of individuals. The, this, the person noted here is the great C.C. Spaulding, the, the great president of about five companies up until his death in 1951, right? And then when he died, five new leaders were created as a result of his death. But, but that's Mr. Spaulding. Um, and, and so there are lots of little hidden clues that exist there, um, and, and I won't um, bother to share this because I know you can read. But, but, but that these funeral programs are important in terms of resurrecting the, the narrative and stories about these people, if you remember nothing else. Um, understand that maps become important. So a great um, colleague of mine in North Carolina A&T, and they are our rivals, but this time I'm going to give them credit. Uh, the, the great black migration map came from my great um, classmate, Dr. Alvin Smallwood, chief of the history department at North Carolina A&T. And this great map, uh, which includes Durham, by the way, gives you a glimpse of what happened with the migratory pattern of African Americans in the, in the 20th century. That's important. Um, city directories and listings, so we're able to go back and take a look at um, these directors, find out what the vocations were. That's important. Uh, and it also included women. One woman listed there is Miss Pearson, Miss Cynthia Pearson, who was a washerwoman by trade, but family owned the majority of the land in, on Fairville Street in our community there. So, so again, city directors and listings are important. Uh, and then as I close out, I, I remind you of this question of the roots of service. And, and the founder of our institution, Dr. James E. Shepard here, with all of his colleagues and friends here, uh, we're among the founders of these economic enterprises and created an institution, North Carolina Central University. In 1925, it became the nation's first state-supported liberal arts institution for African Americans, but also had an early program in terms of creating a school of business where my next colleague, Henry, who's going to come up, Dr. McCoy is coming up. And, and those early students went out and worked in just about every business that he helped to found, from, from North Carolina Mutual to McCann's and Farmers Bank. So you see, they were creating a cycle, a legacy, in a sense. But he also could go back to them when he needed a little money, and they always, always helped him out. 
Uh, and so the, the one important point that I want to note here is when you take a look at the HBCUs, and that number fluctuate, fluctuates, by the way, every now and then. But, but this report for me was important, of looking at the economic impact. And many people um, do not do that. A colleague of mine, the, the late Andrea Harris, uh, just a few years ago, put together a, a study looking at North Carolina Central University. And, and so um, this is a report from United Negro College Fund that looked at the $14.8 billion economic impact of historic black colleges and universities. And in North Carolina, we're talking about $1.7 billion at that time. And so this gives you a glimpse and, and a window into that world of, of the economic impact of these institutions, which should not be overlooked, by the way. And, and so uh, as I close out, I think about what I found that Dr. James E. Shepard said, who founded every business, as I told you, in Durham, uh, and, and the institution said. He said that when talking about his institution, he said, this is my monument. If I am not remembered for this, I will be remembered for nothing. And that's a few area views of his campus. Um, and then last, I'm going to close out on this. Um, this is what I call, uh, made up, by the way, um, <laughs> the, the ABCs of research. Um, understand the important role that archives, whether uh, local or national, play. Um, family Bibles, church records. Um, D, you must have determination <laughs> and not give up, by the way. Some of y'all in here know about that. Um, E, every scrap of paper is important. Remember that. All right, now you won't see this in the textbook, right? So get it. You got it here. Um, again, I talk about the funeral home records, key and important. Um, local libraries, do not overlook local libraries. As a university person, I get it. But, but local libraries don't overlook. Organizational records are important. And then the last part, S, stick for stick to itiveness. Can we all say that together? Stick to itiveness. All right. And if you can get all oh, y'all, y'all doing pretty good. All right. So, so if you can get that, you pass the test. All right. So I want to thank you. Um, feel free to contact me anytime. You ever need anything? We're glad to help. So, okay. Good morning, everyone. It is an honor to be present here and to be seeing everyone in flesh as opposed to in pixelated form on a 15 inch screen. <laughs> um, my name's Mbalu Kamara, and I'm a former research associate of the Cook Center and a current junior consultant of the African Development Bank and a constant artist, both literary and musical. So Rafi Garcia and I will be presenting some findings from the qualitative and quantitative portion of this research study. Um, and I'm going to be going through this pretty quick because we're short on time. But I definitely do want to give thanks to the organizers of this event, to, um, as Ms. Sylvia, Mrs. Sylvia Cook put at the opening, the intellectual liberators who keep inspiring us to come to things like this. and. Um, to all the speakers from whom I'm learning with every story, framework, joke, and perspective shared. So thank you all. On March 10th, 2020, North Carolina declared a state of emergency due to the coronavirus. So our main objective since then has been to understand how we, how policies, how research can better support black business owners um, in the face of emergency and in to a larger extent in the face of uncertainty. So we do that by assessing three things. That's how COVID has influenced black owned businesses, um, how the federal government has played a role in the black business experience, and then finally, how black business owners are coping and responding to all of the changes. So to answer these questions, we first look to the 2019 City of Durham Business Survey um, and this provides us with a pre-COVID snapshot, a portrait of different business characteristics like full-time employees, um, annual, oh, whoa. Interesting. That went quick, okay. Uh, the business survey provides us with information on employment, on annual business revenue, city contracts, barriers to profitability. And so we use data on the Paycheck Protection Program, we all know as PPP, 
which was established by the CARES Act and is administered by the Small Business Administration. It gives us information on loan amounts, on lenders, and loan approval dates. And we constructed actually a black-owned business directory of 342 businesses in Durham using online sources from that listed businesses in 2020 and 2021. And so this data set helped us identify eight black business owners and two black CEOs in Durham. And so through stories, through conversations with them, we used in-depth and semi-structured interviews, through conversations with them, we're able to identify some patterns across their experiences. And our approach is case study based. It uses a case study based logic, not a sample based logic, given that we have such a small uh, sample for our interviewees. So with regard to the pre-COVID portrait of business ownership in Durham, the 754 responses from the survey suggest that black business owners were 2.6 times more likely to have no full-time employees. So the figure shows that black business owners in Durham, um, as you can see in blue, had smaller employment sizes in 2019, which was the year prior to the onset of COVID-19. Um, similarly, when we look at business revenue, they typically make less annually. And only 9.4% of black business owners made between one and 100 million in US dollars in 2019, but the proportion for white business owners was 39.7% in 2019. And then for business age, I'm sure you all can, can guess this, black business owners or black owned businesses in Durham were generally younger in 2019. Um, they were established more recently is what that means. And many studies find that younger firms, younger businesses tend to falter. They're more likely to falter and to fail. So in sum, much of what we find as far as business characteristics for, for Durham-based businesses aligns with national studies on um, racial disparities in business ownership, how black business owners compared to white business owners and their businesses. So given what we know uh, about black businesses and black business owners in 2019, how do we unpack the ways in which COVID impacted them the following year in 2020? We decided to ask them upfront through these interviews. So we asked questions like, how has your business model changed? How have your customer habits changed? How have you adapted and innovated given what you've experienced? What kinds of people, communities, groups, and associations have been important to you in sustaining your business at this time? And then also, how do you feel about the future and why? Which is a, a question I feel like we don't really ask ourselves too much. So the most critical theme that was born out of their responses was that of a changing world of work, like a re redefining world of work, as Professor Van put earlier. So it's a completely different landscape that has governed the workplace and the work space of their business. The business owners, the interviewees that we talked with, they revealed that they underwent common business operational changes so some temporarily closed their active locations, some um, became more lenient and flexible with parents, sometimes even allowing parents to bring their children to the workspace, given the fact that children were essentially thrown into homeschooling during the pandemic. Um, some provided more flexible, flexible work hours and some completely gave up their physical locations. So much of these operational pivots interface with technological adaptations. So virtual learning and meetings via Zoom, as we all know, <laughs> um, digital products, online appointments, virtual assistants, electronic services, QR codes. <laughs> um, these were all opportunities that businesses took advantage of to keep their businesses afloat during the pandemic and still do till this day. 
So one business owner actually in the food industry, she revealed that she started a virtual cooking show with her partner during this time. So that's something she took advantage of. And even with their ability to adapt um, and to pivot, business owners were very honest about how their mental, their spiritual and emotional spaces shifted due to COVID. So some spoke of feeling battle-hardened, so they use military-like metaphors to describe their COVID experiences. Some spoke of leaning on God to help push them forward and to help push their, their businesses forward. Some expressed their fear of one day having to close. And then some revealed that their mindset was one that anticipated future disruption and future hardship. So planning for emergencies is something that really infiltrated their minds and their thoughts at this time. In fact, one business owner stated the following. Our mantra is, what will befall us today? There's a huge, a huge pressure, or a huge amount of pressure to not fall on our face. And this business owner actually revealed that they observed their nine-year-old daughter, or their nine-year-old child, I can't remember, um, waking up every morning and actually saying, what will befall us on her? What will befall us today? It became such a prominent mantra in their household that their nine-year-old child was saying it. <coughs> so these are some examples of the psychological landscape that through which the business owners were navigating their business life. Another key theme born out of their responses had to do with their social interactions and their social systems of support. So many reported benefiting from being in a locality where it's very common to see and to experience businesses helping other businesses. One business owner in the field of spiritual healing stated the following. Since moving here to North Carolina, particularly in Durham, I've had so much support from other businesses, other business owners, and it's just overwhelming. It's way different than it is in Baltimore, excuse me, Baltimore, <laughs> um, where she, she operated a business prior to Durham. And she says, there in Baltimore, it's kind of like you hoard your resources, you know? No one wants to share too much. So many of the business owners in Durham, they viewed information sharing with industry peers as a crucial part of how they remain informed about business protocols, changing regulations, new financing opportunities. And so some of them were members of Durham-based associations like the Greater, the Greater Durham Chamber of Conver Commerce, but some also became a lot more involved in virtual networks. So some started group me chats, some participated in clubhouse chat rooms, which I'm learning about now. Um, and this intra-business communication was not limited to business owners that were only based in Durham. Um, this wider network became a source of motivation and connection, and essentially technology allowed them to generate community in this time. So finally, the business owners not only revealed that their success was about helping the community, uh, about teaching and guiding the collective, but they also acknowledged how crucial of a part the Durham community played in helping them increase their sales and to increase their customer base especially at a time when all of that was threatened by the virus. So in particular, the Buy Black movements and Juneteenth of 2020 played crucial parts in that. Even though they were short-term, these communal efforts did help them cope through COVID. So the social experiences that I described, some of these pivots, the adaptations, and the psychological experiences, all of these that I described were occurring against the backdrop of some funding and some financial trends that Rafi is now going to present to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, okay, so 
Uh, I'm going to be uh, kind of describing what happened or took place in terms of the, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program in Durham. So the idea is that, um, as you know, the uh, PPP was passed to actually help small businesses. So the idea was that uh, you, uh, uh, the, the government was providing additional funding to, to make sure that um, businesses maintain the level of, of employment. So if you were able to, to maintain your employment after receiving the, the loan uh, for a period of 8 to 24 weeks, uh, you can actually be eligible then to, to, to obtain the money for free, meaning like to, to, uh, to be eligible for forgiveness. Um, and these type of loans were provided only uh, with 1% interest rate. So in, in reality, it was a low interest rate loan and it can be, it can be forgiven, right? So you would think that uh, because of that, uh, banks themselves, in this, in this uh, the PPP, they use ba uh, banks to actually provide the, uh, the funds. So you can imagine that if pre-existing discrimination uh, were uh, before, the, before COVID, uh, were in place in Durham, then this can actually help amplify that discrimination, right? So uh, what we try to, uh, to do is to see how um, uh, small businesses, uh, black-owned businesses actually, um, how much uh, they were able to get in comparison to, to whites, but not only in comparison to whites, uh, I, I believe, uh, well, Lisa Cook actually has a, a one paper that investigates this at the national level. So what we decided to do was, is the Durham case different? Uh, given the, uh, the, the historic memory um, uh, in the community. So uh, not only are we interested in, in the, uh, uh, the gap, the funding gap, but also in the concept of self-selection. Are black-owned businesses actually more likely to self-select, to not report their race, because of, uh, they know that they could be discriminated against? So what we do here is uh, we first, actually this is pretty small, but uh, we first uh, do this, uh, provide some, some summary of statistics in which you can see how, let me see if I, um, the unreported race sample versus the reported race, and then the differential. And you see that those that decided not to report their race actually ended up getting almost $35,000 more in funding, meaning through loans, right? So what we decided to do was use that um, break down uh, this into uh, reported, self-reported, uh, not reported, and then uh, compared to those that uh, black and white that self-reported. Um, so here, the other controls uh, that we have uh, are basically loan uh, characteristics as well as some of the uh, location characteristics that we decided to add um, for, uh, to control for in our, in our analysis. Again, I apologize, this is very small. Uh, but here, what we, we want to focus on is on the, uh, the coefficients for black owner. Um, so what we, uh, what we do here is first we control for, some, for just, just racial groups. And the, con the, the reference group here is the unreported uh, 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 subsample. So in this case, uh, those that decided not to report their race. So, and then we added some loan characteristics and some location characteristics and also fixed effects. So we control for the zip code level, industry level, the lender, uh, whether or not they, uh, they're a corporation, as well as the timing, as uh, the paper by Lisa Cook, they also identified that the timing when the loans were given early, um, in, in the early months of the, of the pandemic, you can see that there is a high gap, like a racial gap in terms of funding. So we control for that to see if, um, if in the case of Durham, um, it's actually, uh, we, if, if, to see if, if, if it is different in the case of Durham from the national uh, uh, findings. So, so then we, we, we basically try to control, uh, if you were to, to have a similar business with the same characteristics and then just having a the variation at the, whether if it is a white or black business, compared to those that did not uh, uh, self-report the race. So as you can see here, it's about 40% gap in terms of funding, um, respective to the, not the unreported uh, subsample. So next, what we do is we decide, okay, uh, how about if we compare black owner, business owners to all of the business owners in the sample, and then also just to uh, the unreported race sample, and, uh, and then the third column here is to, uh, in comparison to whites, 
to those that self-reported the race but that are white. And what you can see is that uh, in the first column, you have, you have the significance, uh, significance in the gap, and in the second column as well. But once you control, once you compare black business owners to white business owners that receive the, lo uh, the, the loans, you see that the gap, the, uh, the magnitude is the same, but the significance goes away. So uh, we are interpreting this as, um, as some evidence that banks, the minute you report, then they use that information to compare across groups because they know that government, uh, or in this case, uh, the social planner, is interested in having some type of, 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 um, of equality, right? So then in this sense, uh, they do compare the minute you do reveal your race. So as a result, uh, we, we, uh, we interpret this as a penalty for reporting uh, your race. And that it's, uh, um, basically is not only for, for blacks, but indirectly it also affects whites. So the minute you start, if you know that blacks are being discriminated against, and if, you've rep and if you're white, and you know you're gonna be comparing to, compared to, to that subset of, of, uh, of applicants, then you know that as a consequence, you're also going to be kind of like getting a lower loan amounts. And as a result, we have this game theoretic approach in a way that uh, it's kind of like both groups or individuals are better off not contributing by self-selecting uh, or self-reporting the race. So we decided to do the same thing, but now to see if there is an, a, a gender uh, effect as well. Uh, do black own uh, owners, female black owners, actually face a, a gender uh, gap, funding gap as well. And what we find is that they do not. Uh, outside of, uh, they, they get the, uh, there is a funding gap in terms of race, but not necessarily in terms of gender. And in that case, we do uh, the interaction term here in the third row. So, so then uh, what we sh decided to show, similar to Lisa Cook's paper, was also to describe the timing. So when did this gap actually happened. And what we find is that early months, similar to, to the national uh, data, uh, early months actually drove uh, most of this gap. And the, and the gap came mainly for uh, the loans that received um, the amount of 150000 or less, which uh, the uh, Small Business Administration used that as a cutoff, depending on, on the, the number of jobs reported. So thank you. That's all we have. Yeah. Oh, well, this is basically just summarizing some of the effects, but for the purpose of time, I'm going to pass it down to Henry. Good morning, y'all. Um, happy to be here, and uh, I get to close out this uh, conversation. So uh, um, I want to also acknowledge Bertha Johnson, Carl Webb, who are a couple of members of the team that weren't able to make it here. Uh, Cecilia Rouse talked about yesterday, I mean, to what end does this, do we do this work, right? I mean, why do we do the history? Why do we do the research? Uh, and at the end of the day, you hope to do it to actually make some implementation on the ground. And so I'm gonna talk real briefly about this whole policy side, right? You know, why do we go through this? What do we learn? Uh, and what are we gonna do about it? Um, there's a couple of questions that are important to this. I mean, what is the impact of COVID-19, what impact will COVID-19 and the resulting response have on black businesses that says in Durham? But I wanna give some context. Um, um, you know, the summary kind of statement of this is black businesses were in trouble before COVID uh, and they're in worse trouble now. Um, and that's not just in Durham, that's a, a national statistic. A couple of questions we asked in this particular um, work was this idea of what will the African-American entrepreneur and business landscape look like after um, COVID-19 in Durham? Now, interestingly enough, um, and we talked about early on that, the, um, you know, this whole pandemic and coming about, well, Durham yesterday issued a, a, a uh, reinstated its mask mandate, right? And so we're, you know, we're seeing this cycle continue on. And so that, the question we ask is, well, you know, what would this landscape look like after COVID-19? Um, second is, what can we do to support African-American businesses in Durham um, to ensure that they survive and thrive post-COVID? So it's not just a matter of being able to say, I'm alive after this, but how do you actually move forth and thrive? But at the end of the day, again, you, you first must understand where we were before. And so um, the report that, 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 that has been um, produced, I think, gives a great idea of where Durham was um, and, and, and where it's at. So we want to talk a bit about this kind of policy piece. So what needs to be done in order to have an impact on the businesses now? 
So one of the things is in the short term, they need this immediate cash. Uh, I mean, cash is king. Uh, and so one of the things that we, we um, talked about in this report is the need for there to be capital that goes into these black businesses to ensure that they survive this moment in time, um, these shutdowns, these um, startups and things of that nature. The median term, which looks at it from a standpoint of, you know, not just today, but how do we move forward? There's a couple of things that we talked about, strategic technical assistance, and let me tell you what that actually means. Um, we often hear about technical assistance, um, you know, everything from helping a, a, a business figure out how to do the accounting system or how to have lawyers. But strategic technical assistance is something a little different. Uh, think about it like this, uh, when the pandemic hit, one of the things that, that we know is that businesses had to shut down immediately, and then you had to figure out how to start back up. Uh, what we found, taking one industry like the restaurant industry, on the restaurant industry, um, uh, they, there were so many black businesses that, that were kind of on a, a cash and carry basis. Uh, folks could not go online and order. We know that all, all of a sudden uh, we went to this DoorDash and Uber Eats kind of model. And so strategic technical assistance, for example, means how do you help, for example, those businesses make sure that folks can get online and use their credit cards or debit cards to order food, make sure they connect to those, um, you know, those, those Uber Eats and, and DoorDash and things of that nature. And so it's really uh, helping businesses get ready um, for um, you know, a, a more technically savvy world, being able to move forward. As a part of that also, COVID-related opportunities. There are a lot of opportunities that came about because of COVID, and where did black businesses fit in that? So again, staying with the, uh, the, the, the discussion around restaurants, one of the things that we did in Durham was uh, at the moment that the, the, um, like everything shut down, we saw a number of problems that came about. So when we're talking about equity and, and things of that nature, there are a number of students, um, particularly black and brown students, who get two or three meals a day from school. Uh, and the minute school shuts down, that becomes a problem. We have students, I mean, we've learned we have students who only, those are sometimes the only two meals they get uh, um, in the, in the um, day. And so one of the things that we did, we actually connected black restauranteurs to the school system and say, okay, um, you are now, uh, you know, for all practical purposes, shut down as a restaurant. So um, we raised I mean, several million dollars to provide food and lunches for, for these young kids. And so uh, we paid the restauranteurs to produce lunches and, and uh, breakfast and lunches. And then we uh, set up systems to connect them to the, to the families of, of these students. And so those are COVID-related opportunities. You wanna make sure that that happens. The mask that I'm wearing uh, was done by a black business. Uh, and so it's important to think about you know, those kind of things because there will be continued uh, COVID-related opportunities. And then finally, this idea of long-term uh, procurement and supply, uh, partnerships and investment. What that means essentially is that we have to think about what is this going to look like going forward. What we need is we need to make sure that um, both public and private organizations are uh, connecting in bigger ways to procurement opportunities, to make sure that businesses, um, particularly black businesses, are able to uh, provide services for government, for private at a much larger level. We got to make sure that there's partnerships that are uh, in place to allow these businesses to grow and to expand. And I talked briefly about that in a moment. And investment. You need investment, you need long-term capital, you need patient capital, you need ways by which these black businesses can take in these dollars and grow, hire folks. You heard a, a few minutes ago about the, the, the um, kind of proliferation of black businesses that don't have any paid employees. And that's, again, a, a whole nother conversation. So these are the things that we looked at right now. Uh, you know, how do we think about this in the short, the medium, and long term? Um, I wanna talk real briefly about this idea we really have to think about not just what, where we are at this moment, but how do we change the culture of um, how um, communities interact with their black businesses. Uh, we oftentimes you know, stand up and we, we go through these moments. I've been around long enough to see these cycles, right? Mm -hmm. Diversity, inclusion, and equity is big, and then it's not. Then it's big, and then it's not. Uh, and so you end up with these cycles, and often from an economic standpoint, the cycles are incongruent because it's like, where you know, everybody gets all dressed up and you know, they, they start getting this ready to, to do this business and then you know, it kind of wanes and everybody's like, hey, now where's the opportunity? No opportunity and somebody said, well look, I gotta support my family, so guess what, I gotta go back into the workforce. Then diversity and inclusion becomes popular again. They say, hey, where are all the black folks that, that y'all said we're gonna do this work? And so, it, and so that becomes the issue. There's four, four things that we have to look at really. We have to increase the diversity of black entrepreneurial pipeline. Um, white, the white community essentially controls roughly 80, 85 to 90 percent of every industry in the United States, uh, and, and the average is somewhere around 87 percent. 
uh, you look at all the industries across the United States and you'll see um, black folks uh, on average uh, are in a, uh, control about 1.5% or at least they, they, um, you have anywhere from zero to 3% in pretty much every industry. That's a huge gap. We have to figure out how to create a much more diverse pipeline. Um, we can't build up the entire economy off barbershops and beauty salons. I mean, you know, it's, in, it's important, but it can't be the only industries that, that we have. People like me need barbershops less and less over time, so you know I, I need some other <laughs> industries as well. Uh, strategy two: we have to expand. We have to expand place and space in terms of where black businesses are. Right? We often get relegated to these to these um, uh, these um, kind of poverty sections. Right? Until until um, um, the, the other areas of the community gets really high priced, and then they push you out of those areas. You have to find ways by which black businesses are are really connected across um, kind of all place and space, not only physical space, but online space, right? How do you make sure you're cap capturing dollars? How do you make sure that, uh, you know, in these historic quarters that are, are being redeveloped that, that folks are part of it? I know we're gonna hear something about Tulsa today, um, but you know, here's one thing about, you know, Tulsa is going through this kind of revitalization, right? And it's on the back of this idea of Black Wall Street. Everybody's talking about Black Wall Street 100 years ago. Um, and so it's being rebuilt in Tulsa. But you know the punchline, right? It's not owned by black folks, right? And so place and space becomes an important factor in how do we make sure that, that black businesses grow and expand. Strategy three, we have to increase this, uh, the scale and diversity of capital available to black entrepreneurs and businesses. Uh, everything can't be a loan. Everything can't be, you know, kind of small dollars. You have to really connect to different sources of capital, whether they be, um, you know, um, lending or equity. Those things are important. We have to look at how the public sector invests in businesses, how they, they tend to invest uh, in, in the white ecosystem around what I call wealth enhancing strategies. In the black community, it's also, it's usually what I call social tethering strategies, right? So that old building in the white community may end up as a hotel that the, that the city finds some way to invest in. The old building in the black community, you know, almost always ends up as a community center. And there's nothing wrong with a community center. You just can't build a whole economy off of, off of community centers. Um, and so we have, to, we have to really push that, that investment. And then number four, uh, we have to remove those barriers of success for entrepreneurs, uh, uh, black entrepreneurs. And that's a very broad category on purpose to be kind of this catch all of things. And so that last part, we have to measure that as well. And so we have to measure the number and share of black businesses with paid employees. Black businesses with paid employees are the ones who create wealth. So part of, I can show you data that shows kind of how fast and how great black businesses are, are being created, but they're solo entrepreneurs. And those, they, they live and die with, with, the, with the founder. They don't you know, create jobs and wealth. So we have to measure that, how many of those businesses are being created and how many are, are growing with paid employees. Number two, what is the share of the revenue going to those businesses? We have to make sure that we, we follow that as well. I could also show you statistics. In the 20th century, um, we have not seen as a, black, as, a, as a black business community, we have not seen a, a positive average share of the revenue, which means that even as black businesses are growing in the 20th century, 21st century, the average revenue for those businesses has been negative. What that simply means is that if this, these couple of tables over here starts a business and then they have the revenue, that goes up. These tables add in, in, uh, also start businesses. The revenue doesn't grow. It just gets split among more people in different ways. And so that's what we see, uh, which is why we see a decrease in wealth uh, over time, because as, even as businesses, black businesses are growing, the revenue that those businesses are getting is not growing. Uh, number three, we have to, number three and four really go to hand in hand. We have to really hold folks accountable with the amount of capital that's, that's being invested in black businesses, whether that be from the public sector or private sector. And so we have to keep track of that in real measurable ways. Uh, we know the statistic, you know, 1% of venture capital go to black firms, uh, and, and, and it really may be less than that. And so we have to keep track of how those dollars are being invested because we pay into that system. Those, those, um, those venture capital funds, guess what? They're coming out of your insurance premiums, out of your pension funds all those kind of things, those um, public dollars that get invested, they're coming out of your taxes. And so the fact that they go in one way and, and don't come out, that's a problem. And so we have to track that. And then finally, um, you know, I talked about um, this idea of geographic dispersion. We have to keep track of where black businesses are from a zip code standpoint. And again, also online, where are we at and how are we capturing dollars um, going forward? And then finally, what we do know is this, is that the earlier a child is introduced to innovation, the more likely they are to, to be able to grow up and be innovative adults and create patents and things of that nature. So we have to be conscious about how do we 
make sure our young kids are getting exposed to these things uh, early on. And so that's the key that we, we have to, again, have to change the culture, not just kind of wake up and say, oh, this is a check the box. Um, so kind of as I move to close, people often say, I mean, so okay, so to what end, right? I mean, what, what is the benchmark? I say the benchmark is equity, and, I, and what I mean by that is that uh, we know the racial share of, of a population in the country, right? One of the things, if you think about um, um, you know, where we are today, one of the things, I, the statistics I see often, um, at the end of the civil rights movement, you have what they call civil rights, right? You know, S-I-L-V-E-R, going out the dollars. Well, at that time, African Americans was largely the, the group that was um, kind of put in place to, to think about that. That 10% benchmark that you saw um, you know, back in the 1970s that say, hey, we're gonna carve out 10% or we're gonna have a goal of 10% uh, procurement at the public sector and all these kind of things, that 10% is largely still in place, right? Now the difference is, is that, that, that you know, now you have that same protected class, you know, you've increased, you have veterans, you have um, you know, women, you have all these um, folks in that same class, but that 10% has not grown much. If you watch, if you look at, at local governments, you end up with this situation where that 10% is almost like what we call kind of, it's like tithing, right? You're gonna to tithe to this cause, but it, it, never, it never grows. And so benchmark means this, I just worked with a group of um, black folks in Durham. Um, you know, Durham is probably like everybody else, we've gotten a tremendous amount of money from the, um, recovery, the Rescue Act, right? Um, Durham is getting, a, uh, I think, on the, from the city side, about 52 million, from the, um, from the county side, about 62 million. The school system getting another 160 million, or something from that standpoint. Well, black, a group of black folks came together and they came to me, and what they wanted to do was basically say, look, um, black folks deserve 45% of that money, right? Um, particularly the city and county, you know, 45%. I said, well, how'd you come up with that? They said, well, you know, in Durham, black folks make about 38%. Uh, and they said, well, you know, that's just kind of the start. That extra 7% is for kind of the historic kind of issues that, that we had, right? So, 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 you know, they, and they actually submitted that to the, to the city and the county. And we can see how it plays out. But equity is, you know, understanding what is your share of the overall population and how do you connect to that from the resource standpoint? Uh, I'm gonna give you um, kind of one example as I close out of what equity is not. Now here's the statistics, y'all e economists, right? So, um, so about a year ago, I mean literally almost a year ago today, uh, around August 20th of 2020, Jeff Bezos, uh, uh, who we know as the Amazon man, right, space man. Uh, I don't know about y'all, but like when I go home, I did like Amazon packages on my, on my step like every day. And uh, you know, I think it's my wife and daughter's favorite pastime. But um, so, uh, so I take some credit for this with Jeff Bezos, right? So August 20th, 2020, uh, Jeff Bezos' um, net worth reaches height. Jeff Bezos' net worth at that time was $206 billion, right? He's the first individual to ever go over $200 billion. Now I wanna keep, keep, this, keep this in mind. This is after his divorce, right? Uh, Mackenzie Scott, his wife, which we know has been giving out money left and right, and you know she gave uh, you know 500 some million dollars to black HBCUs. Mackenzie Scott got 25 percent of his of his um, of the stock, right? That made her with that one stock transaction the richest woman in the world, uh, 64 billion dollars. But he still had 206 billion dollars left out of that, right? So here's the compa this is the equity conversation, right? <laughs> he had 206 billion dollars as his personal net worth worth. I did an estimation of, um, you know, kind of a rough estimation, uh, kind of back of the napkin envelope based on trends and things of that nature. There were about roughly three million black businesses in the United States as a whole. Three million black businesses roughly. Those three million black businesses roughly had between 175 billion and 200, uh, 175 and 195 billion dollars in revenue. Now let me say that again. Revenue, that means all the money that came in, not profit, not after they spend that, but total revenue. Jeff Bezos is $206 billion as an individual uh, net worth eclipsed 3 million black businesses revenue. So that gives you some sense of just how big this gap is that, that we're talking about. And so this is serious business. And so the work that you all do is serious business. So the final word I say, kind of bringing it back to Durham, is there's a few things that we did in Durham. Uh, we, we actually, um, Talk, we, we, we actually sent from, from our collective a, a, a memo to the city council, the county commissioner saying that it's, now this is months ago before we knew what kind of money was coming down that said that we feel that, that the city and county of Durham should put aside $20 million just up front to invest in the black uh, business ecosystem without even telling you what it's gonna be, just set that money aside, 10 million from the city, 10 million from the county, 
to build to rebuild a black business ecosystem or at least to start it right and so that was one of the recommendations that we put forth when we sent it to the city council the county commissioners number two um i'm a former commerce guy right and so we dealt a lot with the community B development block grant funds that's when the federal government drops the money down to, to the um, state or the local level and say hey look here's a block of, of funds you can use them for these kind of categories of things um figure out how do you disperse those you have some matching pieces of that we talked about the idea of creating something like that a community development block program for the black for black businesses in the black ecosystem and, and what does that look like and then finally um one thing that, that came up was um as rafi said and things like that on a national level black businesses were uh, in a lot of ways the last to get access to capital when the ppp came out right and there's a whole level of, of kind of data you can look to see the discrimination and things of that nature we talked about the idea of actually retroactive grants, right? Is there a way to go back in these businesses that can show that I was, I was alive before the pandemic, you didn't give me money like you did my counterparts, how do you reinvest to bring those businesses back, you know, as, as, as President Biden would say, uh, build back better, right? At the end of the day, um, we have to recognize just how big this challenge is. And so, I, you know, it's, it's wonderful to have this conversation. I think the report is fantastic, uh, and, and what it comes down to really is that, um, you know, we need all hearts and minds in this work um, because this is um, tremendously challenging. And so, thank you very much on behalf of the group. Dr. McCoy, it's always a pleasure to hear you. Always a pleasure to hear you speak. Uh, I, I'm, I hear the uh, the concerns you and um, and and questions that, that you're raising, and I think of you know that um, program which was a bit, uh, I guess whose results were a bit underexplored um, under under LBJ, the uh, the Great Society. And, and when you raise this issue of public sector investment, I mean, it seems that there was a period of time where the feds were able to disperse into local community organizations that had considerable control of what to do with those, those funds. Um, you know, the feds were able to disperse money to, to, to these organizations and the organizations with some, you know, maximum feasible participation were able to, to do with it what they wish, essentially. And so I guess the question becomes, is like, okay, you know, were Durham or were a, a state entity to, to allocate and then disperse funds to, to, to black businesses um, or organizations, you know, what then, what, what kind of, I guess, planning framework um, would, would have to happen on, on, um, on the community side in order to ensure this the exact kind of uh, a plan that, that you have in that you have in mind, you know. Yeah. So that's 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 all. Okay. Well, that's a great question, right? Because the question I think it it, it comes up when you talk about this this uh, question of you know reparations or question of whatever you know if you drop money down right now, uh, what would happen? I mean, I don't I don't know what kind of you know humor y'all got, but you know there's a you know great um, Dave Chappelle clip, right, <laughs> where you know black folks get reparations and it's like it's like you know. It, it's like, you know, they, they drop down and they, 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 they show this guy, you know, driving this cigarette truck or something. And they say, hey, you know, now that you got your cigarette, now you got your, this, your reparations, uh, you know, you're going to quit your, you know, quit your job, you know, driving this cigarette truck. He said, what are you talking about? I mean, I just brought this truck. You know I mean? You know, it's, 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 it's the sense that, okay, the, the, the ecosystem that, that needs to be there to recapture these dollars is, is not there. I think specifically to your question, I, I say this. I mean, that's why this work is so important to actually, um, you got to build the infrastructure to, to do this, right? You got to build the infrastructure to be able to capture, capture these dollars as they come in. But policy also becomes critical as it relates to um, this kind of work. Uh, and Andre said this before, you got you to you know, you look at the history of, of kind of things and really understand them. So for example, many people don't know that, um, that the, the, the rule in the, in the 501c3, um, the nonprofit status that says you cannot give money to an individual, you have to give money to a 501c3, that came about in the 1960s. The government felt like that, um, you know, um, that, that, that um, 
not that foundations were, were, were investing money in radical black people, right? And so because they felt like that they were investing in radical black people, they, they created a system by which they could control kind of how the money comes into organizations and what you can do with That's where all those things came from. When I was, a, I was a Secretary of Commerce in North Carolina, I was the top official in the state of North Carolina around community development. I had a, a billion and a half dollars, but I also had a book this big that was written by white men and old white men in Washington that basically said what you can do with that. And so I think you have to, you know, I think that's where that, that policy and that, that work comes into play. Um, and also the, you, you really got to build up the capacity um, that, that's really been destroyed um, over time um, that is kind of willing away. And that's why the hollowing out of the, I say the black ecosystem, um, the public, the private, all those kind of things is an important work that needs to happen in order to, to be able to capture these dollars and do something with them. Else, uh, the money comes in and they go right back out. And, uh, and, and so it's an important question. Um, I have a question for Dr. Hardy. Hopper. Uh, and um, I was wondering to what degree the laws of eminent domain were called upon when the district of Haiti was disbanded because of the, the new developments uh, were the people compensated, or did they just come and say eminent domain? Yes, it was eminent domain, and uh, the people got a level of compensation. But um, as uh, Joan Abel indicated, they lost their property. They did, could not go back and rebuild, so they were kind of left destitute. And when we talk about property, we're talking about and I'm from the country. I'm from a small town called Mount Olive, North Carolina. If you eat pickles, you know that Mount Olive pickles. <laughs> you probably ate some Mount Olive pickles. I probably picked some of those pickles, y'all. But people who have homes always have somewhere to go back to. If you run into a rough spot, you say, well, why do you stay at your grandma's house? And uh, some things happen. I don't want to talk about it. But I'm trying to get back on my feet. You always had a place, and that place always had value. Whether it was a broke down, you could see through the floor, it had a value to it. So when people, you lose over 600 homes, all of these people get displaced, and so does that equity that was in those properties. People that lost their businesses, we might not have thought it was that much. It could have been um, a juke joint. That was, the roof had a leak in it, so they had to put buckets down there. But it was a, a, a way, something that they loved. So it's, it's beyond, for me, you know, we talk about eminent domain, but it took so much more than just buildings because it took people's livelihoods and their, their space in a particular part of the city. And, you, you, and when we think about it, it only lasted almost 70 years, but they had all of this money and wealth. And so in comes the ending of, uh, of civil rights movement, and go, it also goes out the Black Wall Street era. So we're talking about Richmond, Virginia. Atlanta only, only becomes big because of Maynard uh, Jackson. And we see where Atlanta's going now. Washington, D.C. When I was here at Howard University, looked totally different. Sometimes, like, I, Asala, by the way, uh, they're, their um, conference is going to be uh, in September, Association for the Study of African American Life and History. They used to have the Black History Lunch across the street. I didn't even know this was a hotel because they were remodeling it at the time. So urban renewal hit a lot of places. You, could, you used to be able to afford a house right across the street from Howard. You can't do it now. And so and the same thing is taking place in Durham. And so we're seeing all of this distribution. And it's a cycle we can see historically. This place runs down, somebody comes in with money, builds this side up, and all the people that can't afford to live here now have to go somewhere else. And that's if they can even stay in the city. Oh, okay, those are my remarks. Yeah, just, just one comment. Uh, I, I found your back of the envelope calculation about Jeff Bezos' net worth relative to all three million black businesses, roughly about 45%. Now, given that, I, I have a... Existential question. A lot of HBCUs are putting a lot of eggs in that entrepreneurship basket. Center is this. Now, granted, the causes and consequences of black entrepreneurship are important from a scholarly standpoint, but as a practical solution into empowering and reducing wealth gaps, it doesn't seem like 
black entrepreneurship is a good practical strategy to close wealth gaps. So why all this disproportionate emphasis upon building black entrepreneurship in HBCUs, given that it doesn't seem to be a feasible practical strategy for closing wealth gaps? I gotta keep that brother away from my school. I'm, I'm a director of entrepreneurship. I got, I got. <laughs> I got, I, mean, I got two kids in college and a mortgage for a little while longer. So, uh, but I would say this, I actually, actually, I actually disagree to this extent, right? I think that what we know about entrepreneurship, I think we spend a lot of time talking about um, the, the, the home ownership gap, which is important, right? I mean, home ownership and the, and the appreciation, I've certainly benefited from being in Durham a long time and, and what's happening. But if you look at kind of the, the, the economic ecosystem, uh, entrepreneurship does matter, right? I mean, because if you think about the, this ecosystem, let's put it in the context of Durham or whatever. Um, when that highway went through the middle of Durham, uh, went through the black community, it destroyed. A, it did destroy more than just wealth, right? It destroyed this whole kind of kind of learning system that allowed people to, to, to get skills to create businesses. When I sit down and talk with some of the same elders that Jim talks to, um, they tell me about you know this Haiti community and what they wanted to be when they grew up. I say, well, how did you? How did you, you know, why did you want to do that? He said, well, because I saw it around me. I saw everybody around me. If you think about business and, 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 and the economy, essentially what, what happens is that you create anchor institutions. You know, anchor institutions largely um, are entrepreneurial. And, and, and whoever owns those entities and those businesses um, largely dictates, you know, who gets internships, who get apprenticeships, what ph philanthropies get money, um, you know, what politicians get supported all those kind of things. things. So I, I don't think it's a panacea, but I think it's a key part of this idea of, uh, that, 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 you know, without having a strong business ecosystem um, at, driven by entrepreneurship. And, and the issue is, I don't think is, is that, that, you know, just simply entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship says, but again, you got to create entities that are growing, that are spending, that are hiring people because, you know, we can, we can for whatever we think, people tend to hire people that look like them they hire people from their community. Women hire more women when they own businesses. Black folks hire more black folks, white folks. I mean, all those kind of things. And so, so you know, I, I think that it is critically important to have that as a part of the landscape because it does influence all these other pieces of the of the um, of the puzzle. So, thank you. So, one more question here. Oh, sorry. Oh, so just, just a follow up, I, one of the things I realized with COVID was um, usually, you know, at the beginning of the semester, you ask, what have you learned? And most students went like, COVID gave them the opportunity to start their own business. Mm -hmm. So they all, you know, and it could be making t-shirts, whatever it was. But that's one thing they said. But at the same time, it affected their academic performance because they were busy managing their t-shirt business or whatever it is, <laughs> you know. So it, it, it's always a trade-off. But then, so right now we are, on a pro, we, are, we are working on, well, it's a grant. We hope we get funded. Whereby we are like, we have a lot of people teaching about entrepreneurship. But who gives them the practical know-how? Because sometimes the people who even ent enter into these things are people who may not have taken a class or a course in entrepreneurship, but they went and studied under somebody to study. And I think maybe the focus should be on how do we give them hands-on experience mm -hmm. as to how to do this, than teaching them in the class with graphs and numbers and calculators that they can't even use. So I, I think we need to think about some of these things. Thank you. <laughs> Look, everybody's after, everybody's after my job in this place. So <laughs> I'm not coming back here next year, Gwen. Um, but, <laughs> but, but you know, for, I, I, hope there's no, I hope there's no recording, but I actually agree with you, right? So, uh, so I, I, came, I, you know, I came to the academic world um, through business and entrepreneurship. I was a banker for a number of years. I started my own firm. I sold my firm. I got into the classroom because I actually wanted to teach um, 
students the things I wish there would have been somebody there to teach me, right, when I was kind of struggling through and things of that nature. And so I try to uh, leave my, my classroom that way. And I, I, it is critically important. I, I think, but it, I think these questions actually tie together in the sense that, uh, again, part of what we've seen is just the, 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 the um, disintegration of the um, black um, kind of entrepreneur ecosystem in a way that, that really does help, um, you know, the community um, get that practical training. You're right. I mean, entrepreneurship uh, at its core is not something that, that you can just learn by sitting in the classroom, right? Uh, I mean, it's something that you have to do. And part of the challenge is this is where this whole capital piece comes in. This is where that 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 wealth gap does, um, you know, uh, you know, is important. I remember I was sitting at a at an event um, that we held um, a few years ago, you know, about diversity, inclusion, investment. And there's a white guy, a young white guy. He was standing up telling us all how, you know, with all his grit and all the work that he did and all the things that he sacrificed and all that stuff, that along with like a three million dollars that he raised from his family and friends. Is, is you know what you know what kind of kind of help him move forward. The reality is that that you know, uh, and we all feel this pressure, right? If you're a black entrepreneur and, and you raise capital, I mean, like everybody's looking at you, right? What you gonna do? Are you gonna be successful? Because what you, how you end up, or your success or failure, will have a tremendous impact on kind of who's following you, right? I say all that through this context is that really what drives entrepreneurship is the ability to to to, to um, try and fail try and fail and learn stuff and succeed, right? Black folks don't get that, that chance, right? I mean, you, you try and you fail, you try, you try it again and see what, what, what's gonna happen. It's not just you, it's gonna be everybody look like you. You know, I, I remember talking to a, a, a white um, uh, investment um, 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 venture capitalist down in Atlanta and uh, we were just having a conversation and, and uh, you know, essentially the gist of the conversation was that uh, I was trying to introduce him to somebody. He was like, basically, they already have their, their black um, investment. That, that one, right? So I think that's where this idea of who has the wealth, who controls the wealth, I mean, we know that the tech giants, I mean, those individuals, their wealth skyrocketed during the pandemic, right? I mean, like, like by trillions. Um, when they have that, those resources, they can then reinvest in their kids and reinvest in their neighborhoods. They can reinvest in all that, and, and that whole cycle keeps going. And so I agree with you. I mean, I think, it's, it's a, I think the, the real education has to happen in the real world um, um, but, you know, hopefully uh, until retirement, they think that I'm worth, you know, keeping, uh, you know, at the university. So, <laughs> no, nah, but, 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 yeah, I mean, I, th I think you're right. I mean, but, but I think that's the issue around um, why capital matters. I mean, we did a conference called Capital Matters a few years ago. I mean, that's why capital matters. People need the, the ability to have resources. And the last thing before we go to this, that's actually what North Carolina Mutual did, right? North Carolina Mutual, if you don't recognize the investment space, basically all of us got insurance some, one way or another. It's like, a, it's like the most incredible business in the world, right? You, you, pay, you pay for something you hope you never use, right? And so, so they get, the insurance companies get the money and they invest in real estate, they invest in business, all this kind of stuff. It's always worked like that. The difference is when North Carolina Mutual, which was the largest black business in the world for, for really much of the 20th century, when they got the money, they, they trusted money in the hands of black folks, right? So they, they invested. That's why that ecosystem looked like that. We don't have that ecosystem anymore. And so that's the challenge, one of the challenges that we have. So. It's your last question, brother. Uh, yes, and uh, uh, thank you for remaining up here and uh, you know, uh, answering these questions. As you can tell by you know, everyone's interest, entrepreneurship, uh, especially amongst uh, uh, black folks and African Americans, are near and dear to everyone's um, heart. Um, but just given, you know, some of the uh, capital uh, uh, discrepancies that you've outlined, you know, the three million or so businesses who are primarily only employing, you know, uh, themselves, uh, essentially having less revenue than just Jeff Bezos, right? I mean, you know, that comes out to be, you know, probably less than a uh, hundred uh, a grand a year for, um, you know, you know, comparing that to his wealth, which is owning a good job, right? but not the same scale that, you know, you'd want to do business uh, in the uh, richest country in the world. Um, so with that being said, um, we do know that, you know, you would need a more uh, redistributive uh, policy, like a reparations or something that would probably be um, less um, dramatic than some other solutions. But entrepreneurship is definitely, um, it's definitely uh, one of the ways to maybe um, maybe uh, at least, you know, maybe reduce some of the, of, of the uh, damage in COVID and start rebuilding these businesses. Um, so I guess my question then is, 
there, um, in, in the, some of these uh, programs that you're uh, highlighting in some of these initiatives, is there an emphasis maybe on some of the non, maybe traditional entrepreneurs? I mean, I mean, again, when we're thinking about, you know, college educated people, uh, white collar, you know, um, professionals, and, and, and these folks who have, you know, already kind of have access to a um, more skilled, more white collar uh, labor market um, would perhaps, you know, targeting um, uh, folks that do not have uh, access to the same market, you know, uh, maybe, you know, um, at least somewhat uh, contribute to uh, building um, wealth. I mean, if you have the choice between working, you know, a white collar or skilled uh, labor position, you're already in the labor market, is moving that, you know, $100,000 or less from uh, one employer to self-employment, is that as uh, impactful for the community as opposed to a person who has been largely excluded from the labor market and then is now, um, even if it is owning, you know, that job or whatever, are they now not um, creating perhaps an additional uh, source of revenue? Um, so as far as targeting um, those folks who, you know, with 75 percent, about you know, 75 percent of African Americans are not college educated, for instance, mm -hmm. right? So you know, I mean, it, you know, with the, uh, focusing too much on the, you know, the the, ed the educated and, and and that type. Um, yeah, you know, I, so I, think I, I, I see, see where I'm going. I see Gwen standing up, so I know she says, she, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask this question. Uh, I'm going to ask this kind of very, as briefly as I can. I, I think right. that it really, it really is, is, is all of that, right? I mean, we have to be able to, we have to have entrepreneurs that come from all places. I'm in the school of business, and I tell folks all the time, I mean, most entrepreneurs don't come from the school of business, right? Maybe managers come from the school of business, entrepreneurs don't. It's going to have to be a combination of both, you know, folks who, who kind of come up, you know, as they say, the hard way, and folks who, you know, have, have these kind of white collar jobs. The thing I say about that is that going back to this idea of, um, you know, this, this, this young man that talked about the three million he raised from his friends and family. The reality is, is that for, for black and brown folks, largely, the friends and family works in reverse, right? So, you know, you come up and then you go off to college, you go, you know, you get that, that you know, you, you know how to take the standardized test, you get that good job, as my mom used to say, you know, you start making money and then you, you send the money back to help somebody keep the car running, to keep the lights on, all this kind of stuff. The idea that somehow I'm gonna turn back to that group and ask for 50K or something like that, it's, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous, right? You know, I'm gonna I'm call my Aunt Rose and say, hey, Aunt Rose, you know, clean out your savings. And, and so, but, but I say that because of this. Because of that, there's like this kind of truncated process that happens because of that and the discrimination in capital. If, you know, if, if somebody jumps out of one of those, you know, uh, six-figure jobs into the entrepreneurial landscape, it's not just them jumping in that, that, right? It's their whole network. And so that whole network is not at risk. If there's discrimination in the marketplace, you can't get money. And so it actually truncates this. And so I, I'm going to finish it by saying this. I think that, that we need a lot more entre black entrepreneurs in the landscape in order to make this work. But right now, it's just out, it's hard to outbid white folks, right? You know, many of the folks that should be kind of starting business and growing business that know these businesses, they're like the vice president of diversity or vice president of something at somebody, some big white company, right? Because, you know, at the end of this, the, the, the civil rights movement, um, that became the thing, right? We're going to create a, you know, that was the decline of Motown, right? You know, Capitol Records created the urban division, which they had no interest in before that. And so, you know, it's a much deeper conversation, but, but uh, you're right. I mean, the, 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 I think to sum it up is this is that it really is, is not one thing or another. Uh, I always tell mayors when they come to me and ask me, they say, well, you know, you know Dr. McCoy, what, can, you know, what are the one or two things we should be doing that, that, that really you know, create equity and turn the tide? I said, look, Mayor, I'm happy to tell you a couple things that you should create, but it wasn't one or two things that got us here. It's not going to be one or two things that gets us out of this. It's going to be something much bigger. And so happy for the question and happy to be here. Thank you all. Thank you.